Hi, I'm Jenny Brocky. Tonight on Insight, multiple sclerosis. Who's getting it? Why are they getting it? And is there hope with new treatments? I remember praying, like, please, please be a stroke. I didn't want MS. No, you're not sick. You don't have MS. You're too young. You look fine. It wasn't supposed to be genetic. She was supposed to be safe. There's been a huge revolution in treatments for relapsing remitting MS. People were getting up out of wheelchairs and walking. You were put on an immunotherapy drug. Is it helping? Honestly, it saved my life. Welcome everyone, good to have you with us tonight. Zoe, you're 22 now. How was your life looking at 17? What were your plans? I was in my final year of schooling. I was doing VCE and I had plans to study science. I've always wanted to be a vet, so I was kind of on that pathway. Um, you love animals? Yes, yes, I do and love animals. And horses in particular? Yes, always. I started riding when I was three years old. My parents made the mistake of putting me on a pony. And um, ever since then, I haven't really stopped with the horses. So I was competing in dressage at the time. And I always wanted to get to the top of my sport. Mm. Now, you were living in Melbourne and you'd been having some odd symptoms. What were they? I had severe vertigo, um, nausea that came with it. Uh, my speech was a little bit impaired. Um, it just felt like my body was humming, kind of uh, almost vibrating, I guess. And I actually ended up in emergency because I'd been sick so many times. And they said that I probably had a inner ear virus infection thing and that all my symptoms were coming from my vertigo. Mm. And then you stayed? Yeah, they discharged me early in the morning and I went home and over the next couple of days I didn't feel much better. And then on the Thursday um, I woke up with total right-sided numbness um, and my speech was worse again and my vision was blurry, uh, not, not severely but just a little bit, mm. so we went back to hospital again. And then what did they say? They still said to me that it could be part of the virus. They weren't entirely sure. So I went home again, and Friday I was quite well. I was up and moving around the house. But then Saturday morning I woke up to my mum shaking me, because um, she had actually thought I'd died in my sleep. I was apparently grey. My lips were blue and I couldn't walk. So this had all happened in a really short a amount of time. Yeah. When did you find out that you had MS? Well, I went into hospital again that day and they decided to do an MRI. And at that point, I had 23 lesions on my brain and spinal cord. And I was actually diagnosed with a rare autoimmune condition called ADEM. And it took a few months after that for the MS diagnosis to come up. I had a lumbar puncture and stuff like that. What were you told to expect when you were told you had MS? My doctor said to me that if we didn't start some sort of aggressive treatment pretty soon, I would end up pretty impaired, wheelchair dependent. Did you know what MS was? I knew that it was a neurological condition. I'd done things like the MS readathon, but I didn't know what it meant long term. I didn't know that there, there was no cure. Mm. Lavinia, you're 24. You started getting symptoms when you were 18 yeah. and at university. What were the symptoms? So for about a week, I had uh, really bad fevers um, and my eyes went blurry, mainly in my left eye. Um, and about two weeks after the fever stopped, um, I realised that the blurriness is not going. Uh, so my mum suggested going to the GP just to do some tests. And you took yourself off to see him. What did he say? We went through a process of just doing some tests on my eyes just to rule out any sort of infections or any other diseases, um, and which showed up. Uh, came up with nothing 
Um, and he did have a few patients with multiple sclerosis, so he thought that it might be multiple sclerosis before he referred me to an ophthalmologist. Did he tell you that, that he thought it might be MS? Yes, he did. And he... how did you react when he raised that? Um, I was very shocked. I... <laughs> Did you know what it was? No, uh, oh, I had heard of it. My PE teacher, um, his wife had multiple sclerosis and I remember her walking into school one week and then the next week coming in a wheelchair. So I knew it was something very serious. What were you told to expect? I was told that everyone's different with multiple sclerosis. Um, he said it might be 10 years before I get in a, into a wheelchair or might be never. And how were you reacting as all of this information was coming at you so young? I was completely freaking out <laughs> as uh, someone who just turned 18 um, would. Um, I was studying at uni, I was just living life and all of a sudden this curveball was thrown at me. Mm. Yeah. And how were your family and friends reacting? Uh, my family was in denial at first. I felt pretty lonely, pretty isolated. Um, during that time, my dad used to say that it's all in my head, that it's fine, just don't think about it. Was there anyone that you could talk to about it? I did tell a good friend, but she kind of shrugged it off. No one really knew about it because no one really... Uh, had anyone to refer to as who had multiple sclerosis. Let's have a look at what multiple sclerosis does to the body. MS attacks the central nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord and the optic nerves. The central nervous system sends messages along the nerves to different parts of the body which control all our functions. Healthy nerves are insulated by a fatty substance called myelin and that ensures the correct flow of messages through the nerves. In MS, myelin can be damaged, attacked by the body's own immune system, which causes messages along the nerves to be blocked or to be distorted. Now, depending on which part of the central nervous system is affected, MS can cause symptoms, including fatigue, pain and muscle spasms, loss of balance, bladder or bowel dysfunction, and difficulties with vision, speech and memory. Carolyn, you're 36. When did you start getting symptoms and what did you think was going on? I first started getting symptoms in 2015 and early 2016. What symptoms were you getting? At the time, I thought it was just um, like a, a sports injury. What sports were you doing? Pole dancing. Yep. <laughs> so it's quite intense. I would get shooting pains and a burning sensation right up the back of my neck and also tingling sensations when I would put my head down sometimes. It was debilitating. I would literally, it would stop me in my tracks. I'd feel like I was about to be sick everywhere um, and I would need to <laughs> squat down in a little ball and take a few breaths until that um, sickness feeling went away and that burning sensation went away. You went to get it checked out. Where did you go initially to see what it was? I thought it was just a sporting injury. So by going to see a chiropractor and a physio and possibly a myotherapist at the time um, and a combination of those three would sort, um, you know, my sports injury out. And they thought it was yeah. something muscular. Yes. So they, the chiropractor did some scans at the time and he did say that... Um, there was lots of inflammation, um, but he never he never pointed the direction towards MS. What happened after that? I was training really hard for um, Miss Pole Dance Australia, um, which is probably the biggest national competition in the pole dancing community. Um, so I'd made it to nationals. It was a really big deal. So I was training really hard. I woke up in the morning to teach my Sunday morning classes and I had this fuzzy spot in my eye and in the space of 72 hours it, uh, my my eyesight in my left eye was just rapidly declining to the point where I'd lost about 95% of my vision in my left eye. Was there any mention of MS at this stage? Absolutely not. 
So I went to the GP and she's like, you should have gone to the hospital straight away, anything to do with your senses, you know, you should have really done something. I said, well, you know, I, I feel physically fit like I could run a marathon, but my eyes just not feeling right. And she's like, okay, well, I'm gonna try and get you in to see an ophthalmologist. So we did that and he is the one that said, oh, you've got optic neuritis. But again, there was no mention that there were links to optic neuritis and MS. He just said it's inflammation of the optic nerve. So you ended up in hospital. I did. When yep. was MS first raised and how did you react? It was actually the triage nurse when they were registering me um, into the department that said, oh, now I can see here on the notes that you're here to be treated for MS. And I nearly fell off my chair because no one had actually even mentioned those words to me by that stage. And obviously my worst fear had been, you know, made real. Mm. You were married. Yes. How did your partner, your husband react? I think he was just in shock. He didn't really display a lot of emotion other than physically being there by my side um, at every spare moment ordering me Uber Eats because I refused to eat the hospital food. <laughs> what about others, friends and so on? How did they react when you told them you had MS? There were definitely friends um, that blew my mind that were there for me through thick and thin and then others just completely disappeared. So people just literally disappeared? Yep. Didn't even bother to come and see me in hospital. Uh, Lavinia, what sort of reactions did you get from people when you told them at 18 that you had MS? Um, I got a lot of, uh, is it contagious? Um, yeah. 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 Really? Quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a lot of people were a bit wary about hanging around with me because they thought it was contagious. Um, Don't I got breathe. A, yeah. <laughs> you might catch it. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> um, so, oh, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a lot of people exactly like you just disappear completely. Mm. How is it affecting you at the moment? At the moment, I am actually going through a relapse. Um, my legs uh, do get numb a lot. I do have um, incontinence with my bowels and bladder, so that's a daily struggle. This is my sixth uh, prescription for my glasses in the past three years, so my eyes are getting worse. Carolyn, what about you, given what you do competitively, the pole dancing? How is MS affecting you? Um, it was definitely my motivation to get back to feeling like I could achieve again. Um, so that's definitely helped me. I struggle with fatigue daily. I have nine to ten hours sleep a night. Usually it's restless as well. Um, and I wake up and I feel like I haven't slept a wink. <laughs> and so I'm just consistently exhausted all the time. Another thing that I struggle with um, is my left eye is constantly numb. The lights affect it my balance is affected sometimes. But you're still pole dancing, aren't you? I am, because I feel like, what's the point in life if I can't still enjoy the things that I love to do? You look amazing doing this. Oh. It's, I mean, it, it <laughs> really is extraordinary. Do, do people find it hard to, to see you doing that yep. and accept the idea that you have MS? 100%. They're like, oh, you look so good. You look amazing. Uh, are you better now? <laughs> no. <laughs> Zoe, what about you? How, how are you at the moment and, and how is it affecting you? I have the same with the fatigue. Um, at the start, the fatigue wasn't so much of a problem, but um, five years on from my diagnosis now, it's really wearing me down a little bit. And how do those lesions on your brain affect you physically? Like, how many of them do you have? So I have over 46 at the moment. Some of them are really severe. I have a massive one over my memory. So that's made university quite difficult. Um, my concentration's affected, things like that, my balance. Mm. Todd, you're a neurologist. Three quarters of Australians who are being diagnosed with MS are women, mostly young women. 
like these three. Why? Well, you've started with a, a difficult question there because the answer is that no one really knows. Uh, possibly there's uh, a, a genetic influence on the immune system um, of women that makes them a bit more susceptible to developing things like uh, MS. But there might be some environmental uh, factors that are important as well. And it's possible too uh, that women are having fewer pregnancies now and there's a bit of evidence that pregnancies are a little bit protective uh, against MS. People have pursued the idea that there might be hormonal differences uh, uh, you know, related to being male or female that make uh, women more susceptible to MS. It's been very hard to prove, but that's certainly a possibility as well. And there are different types of MS. Yes, all, all these three women have the same type. You all have relapsing, remitting <laughs> yep. MS. Um, just tell us quickly about the different types. Yeah, so there's three main types. So the commonest form uh, that about 90% of people get diagnosed with at onset is relapsing, remitting MS. And that's uh, a type of multiple sclerosis where, sort of, as we've heard, uh, people can get uh, attacks of neurological symptoms, relapses, um, in, uh, which come and go. Mm. So, so you go into remission remit. exactly. as well. Yep. Uh, and that happens uh, naturally. But over time, the natural history of MS in untreated patients is that after about 15 or 20 years, then those relapses or attacks uh, occur, start to occur less frequently and people gradually start to develop uh, dis a progressive disability. And that's referred to as secondary progressive. MS and then the third type is primary progressive uh, MS and so that's about 10% of people at diagnosis um, and in that relapses are, uh, don't occur frequently at all uh, if at all um, and that's just a steady accumulation of disability over time. How quickly does MS progress in people? It's very variable so it can have quite aggressive uh, um, onset of MS. And again, if left untreated, they can become disabled very quickly from that. But other people have much more benign forms of MS, which means that they can go for many years without attacks or without requiring any disability, even without treatment. Uh, and there's a huge spectrum of severity uh, in the middle. And I'll never forget it. He said to me, no one will ever want you if you're in a wheelchair. How did you react at the time when he said that? I thought, well, maybe no one will want me. I was only 22 at the time, so it was really frightening. Sophie, you were... When you stay to stays, you always get the whole home. Because is it really a holiday home if you have to share the house with a host? Dominic Perrottet and the Liberals sold $90 billion of essential assets in 12 years. Now Perrottet won't rule out selling Sydney water. It's clear, after 12 years, you'll pay with Perrottet. Authorised by Bob Nam for Australian Labor Party, New South Wales Branch, Sydney. When you stay to stays, you always get the whole home. Because is it really a holiday home if you have to share the house with a host? Wow, Apple. Best picture. So amazing, right? Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence. Selena Gomez documentary. Well, I have a documentary. DiCaprio, Scorsese, De Niro. Hey, Apple. Call me. Twenty-one, when you were diagnosed with MS about 17 years ago, this had particular significance for your family, didn't it? Your diagnosis. Yeah. Why? Um, yeah, because my sister was diagnosed two years earlier. Mm. And Monica, how old were you when you I were diagnosed? 20. You were 20. And you were how old? 21. 21. What symptoms had you had? So I remember when I was 21, I was writing an email to my brother and my hand kept slipping and that seemed odd and I mentioned it to mum. So she said, let's go to the GP. And he did <coughs> some tests and it seemed my whole right side was weak. So I couldn't move my leg properly. He said, touch your nose. And I was like, I just couldn't do it. And they said to me, you definitely, this is a stroke. There's no way you're having this. Your sister's got MS, so you've got no chance. It's a stroke. Were you thinking it was MS? 
I, I hoped it was a stroke because my sister had MS and all I knew about MS was wheelchairs. So I remember praying like, please, please be a stroke. I didn't want MS. So how did you react when it was confirmed? I, I was devastated. I think I was in shock. I was 21, it just seemed too young. And my sister had it too, like it just seemed so unfair. Mm. And Monica, what was it like when you heard Sophie had it as well? I was shocked. It wasn't supposed to be genetic, so she was supposed to be safe. And how had you been managing your MS in those two years? It was pretty aggressive for me. I was having an attack every three to six months. My legs were pretty bad. I just didn't want that to happen to my little sister. Mm. And Sophie, you were engaged at the time that you were diagnosed. You'd been with your fiancé for seven years. Yeah. How did he react? Yeah, he was probably just as much in shock as we all were because I did actually end the relationship maybe a year later after diagnosis and not because of the MS or anything like that. But I think a way for him to try to get me to stay was he said to me, and I'll never forget it, it was a long time ago, but he said to me, no one will ever want you if you're in a wheelchair. When you yeah, wanted to well, break he, up with him. For him to try to get me to stay, it was, yeah, no one will want you, you'll be in a wheelchair. That's horrible. Yeah, and so that's always just stuck with me. It's how did horrible. Yeah, how did you react at the time when he said yeah, that? Yeah, well, I guess he was trying to scare me and that was my fear, I guess, because I thought, well, maybe no one will want me. I was only 22 at the time, so it was really frightening. And I'm really proud of myself. I left him. I was like, no, I'm, I'm fine, I can do this. And I'm married now and I'm really happy. And How long did that stay with oh. you for, that comment? I couldn't tell that story. I reckon it's only been like in the last two years, but it would always make me cry just saying those words. It was, yeah, really, really painful. It, yeah. Mm. You both have the same type of MS. Does it affect you in similar ways or not? No. Um, I have had far more mobility problems. Um, I've fought against it, but I've had to accept a walking stick or a wheelchair to go shopping and that sort of thing. And I have a lot more fatigue and memory problems and mind fog. If I'm tired, I will lose words. I have to work a lot harder to pass as normal. Mm. And I guess I've probably got more invisible symptoms. Physically, I, yeah, people, a lot of people wouldn't know I have it. Mm. So. Was there any family history of MS? After we both got diagnosed, my uncle was then diagnosed and my mother found out a cousin of hers has MS. So we seem to have a bit of a history now. Todd, is MS genetic? So there's certainly a genetic contribution to MS and one way that we know about that, some of the earliest ways we know about it, was looking at studies uh, in identical twins. And so uh, if you had MS, uh, then the risk that your identical twin would also develop MS uh, was about 30%. So that tells you that there is quite a strong genetic component to developing MS, but it also tells you that there's a fairly substantial environmental contribution as well. Well, we know that Tasmania has the highest rate of MS in the country. You're seven times more likely to get MS in Tassie than, say, in North Queensland. So we went to the central highlands of Tasmania to find out a little bit more. Moyen is one of the coldest places in Australia. Because we sit so high up in the western lakes of Tasmania, we, we get snow all year round. You don't stay outside for long because your nose gets very sore. I'm Peter Glowacki. I'm 38 years old. Oh, I got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis three years ago. The cold relaxes the damage that's been done. It makes my life a lot easier. I'm able to do a lot more. Warm temperatures, they make me really uncomfortable. Your legs tingle a lot worse and the numbness is a lot worse. My symptoms started with these funny sensations and really bad back pain. The wife took me to the doctor and the doctor told me that I need to stop twisting and everything should be fine. I go back to work and then about a week later I started getting these real bad pins and needles, tingling sensations in the legs. I knew something wasn't quite right. 
when I was diagnosed, it was a bit of a relief. We thought it could have been cancer or something a lot, lot worse. Every day is different. Well, today I'm not too bad. Tomorrow I could wake up and not be able to get out of bed. I reckon just down around the corner here, they should be out there feeding. Yeah, I still love going fishing. I used to go with my grandmother and my father down the waters when I was a little child. You never know what you're going to catch. Fishing gives me a sense of purpose. I'm good at it. I enjoy it. It also makes me push myself. But I will wear myself out. I could wake up in a wheelchair. I could wake up blind. I could wake up and not remember a thing. You just got to kick along with it. Yeah, if Dad ever ended up in a wheelchair, I'd still find the time to take him out on the water. I don't try and hold back on anything. If I want to go and do it and I'm capable of doing it, I'll try. MS will never stop me from fishing, even if it's parking on a wharf and just sitting in the car watching the kids fish. I'll always be a part of it. I don't understand why I got MS or why people get in Tasmania more than anywhere else. It's just one of those mysteries. Bruce, you're Peter's neurologist. Why does Tasmania have the highest rate of MS in the country? It's not only in Tasmania, but in areas with, at a higher latitude in the, both in the northern and the southern hemisphere, there's a significantly increased risk of getting MS. We think it's largely due to decreased winter ultraviolet exposure, which means um, in, when, in the winter in Tasmania, you, no ultraviolet light radiation hits the ground at all for about eight weeks. And 95% of the vitamin D we have in our system is made by ultraviolet radiation hitting our skin. And in Tasmania, nearly everyone to, in the beginning of spring is vitamin D deficient. And we found a strong association between vitamin D levels and the risk of MS. So where is your research on that up to? Can you say for sure that vitamin D deficiency can contribute to MS? Yes, we can say that it's one of the, one of the contributors. Um, but it's important to remember that the risk of MS may be different from the factors that are associated with MS getting worse or having relapses. We are doing a study around Australia at the moment looking at people who have had their first attack of MS. So we're trying to treat those people with different dosages of vitamin D or a placebo. But it may be that vitamin D is not the answer. It may be the ultraviolet radiation itself is the thing, because ultraviolet radiation has a significant effect on your immune system. So vitamin D might be a proxy measure of how much ultraviolet radiation you've exposed to. Is there any evidence that taking vitamin D can pre help prevent MS? MS? Um, no, there is absolutely no evidence that it can. We've, we've shown an association with the risk of getting MS, but there's a whole lot of other reasons why that might occur. To prove causation, you've got to show that if I give people with vitamin D, or, um, that they will do better than people who don't have vitamin D. And that evidence is lacking. Mm. And what about taking it once you've been diagnosed? So we do recommend people do take it. It's cheap, it's easy to use, and it's essentially side effect free. So people should take it because if there is a benefit, it's a, it's a safe benefit that they can get. Mm. Lydia, you're joining us from your home in Melbourne. You've been living with MS for 26 years. How has it affected your life? I used to work as a doctor. I don't work anymore and I can't drive. So I'd say that's pretty much affected it a lot. Mm. A hell of a lot. Why are you living in a nursing home? Because I can't transfer anymore from my wheelchair. My wheelchair to my bed, wheelchair to the, to the toilet, it has progressed and it's just become worse. And you were living alone? Yes, exactly. I was living alone. I couldn't get somebody to come there to help me to be my, my carer. Anyway, I ended up here. So, yeah. Do you have friends and family who support you? I've got my mum and my sister live, nearby, near, live nearby. My brother comes often to visit. Uh, my, I've got good friends who I used to work with and I used to know from my hometown. And uh, So, yeah, I've got good support. And yeah. living there, what's it like for you? Well, you know, it's, it's all right. I am um, making the most of the pretty weird situation so I 
spend, I don't associate with the other residents. Uh, they're like, they're nice, but um, they don't speak English. They actually speak Italian. So mm. that's, yeah, it's just difficult. And is there anyone around your age in the nursing home? No, it's just me. You graduated in medicine, didn't you? Yeah, Even did. though you were only yeah. 20 when you were, when yes, you were diagnosed. Did. When did you have to give up practising medicine? OK, I practised for 15 years. So I stopped practising um, in September 2012. Mm. And what was that like to have to give it up? I, I just had so many things going on. I just was moving to a nursing home and I was, I was losing my independence. So I guess stopping work was probably one of the least things, I, last things I thought of. But I still wish I worked as a doctor because it was great. So how do you cope day to day with your MS? I'm used to it and I don't focus on my MS. I focus on other things in my life. So watching TV, going out, going to a movie, uh, just distractions. Constantly looking for distractions. Todd, what's the difference between Lydia's MS, which is secondary progressive, and the other types of MS? Secondary progressive MS usually follows on from relapsing remitting MS, or at least it does in you know, untreated uh, patients. And we're already seeing that it's occurring much less often uh, than, it, than it did um, before so treatments people, were available. So people get relapsing remitting and then it can turn in to secondary progressive. Does it always turn into secondary progressive? There was a time, again, this is before treatments, where about 75% of people would get uh, secondary progressive MS, but it's now getting closer to about 50% of people will get, 70, uh, get secondary progressive MS. And with a lot of the stronger therapies that we have available now, we're hoping that we can continue to shift that uh, so that fewer and fewer people do develop secondary progressive MS, or if they do, uh, they develop much later on than they would have most of the people we've spoken to here have relapsing remitting MS, uh, which is the most common type. How much has the treatment for that changed in the 20 years since Sophie and Monica were diagnosed? Um, so there's been a, a huge revolution in treatments for uh, uh, relapsing remitting MS. There's about 13 treatments for MS which have been shown in clinical trials uh, to actually improve outcomes in MS some of those medications, particularly the intravenous medications, are particularly efficacious at doing the job of stopping relapses or limiting them significantly um, and, and limiting MRI activity. So we're very hopeful that we're going to see uh, huge benefits um, in terms of delaying and preventing disability. Mm. Monica, how do the MS treatments you had initially 20 years ago compared to your treatment now? Initially, they weren't that effective. They kept changing different medications. I did intramuscular injections. Eventually, I kept deteriorating, so they said, try light chemotherapy. So I did that for two years, which was worse and worse. Mm. And now? What now, are you taking now? I have a Tysabri infusion once a month, and it's quite pleasant. I'm much more stable. I've maybe had two attacks in the last three years. But they weren't big attacks, so I'm still pretty pleased. Mm. Sophie, what about you? What treatments have you tried? When I was first diagnosed, I was on um, injections and there weren't many options. And I remember for the, maybe the first four years, I was having an exacerbation every six months and that meant going into hospital, going on steroids, and it was horrendous. It was really frightening. But now I'm on a daily tablet called Galenia and it's fantastic and I haven't had an exacerbation. I think it's been seven years. Zoe, you were put on an immunotherapy drug, Tysabri, yeah. um, pretty much straight away. Is it, is it helping? Yeah, I started the day after I was diagnosed and honestly it saved my life. I haven't had a relapse since, so it's been what, five years now. And that's despite the brain lesions that you have? You, you're stabilised? Yeah, so they're still, um, I guess they're still there. They're like scar tissue, sort of. But they're not um, active and I haven't had any new ones. So it's been amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bruce, how important is early diagnosis and treatment despite any side effects it might bring? One of the critical factors in outcome is the time between onset of disease and starting treatment. We now know that, that the shorter you make that, 
you reduce the risk of having uh, relapses dramatically with the new medication. It also reduces the likelihood of progression of disability and also the likelihood of the secondary progressive MS. So early treatment is important. Because that treatment can prevent damage. Yes. The research we and others have done has shown that the more relapses you have, the more damage you're having in the brain. And there's a direct relationship between the number of relapses and the, uh, the level of disability. Mm. And that damage, if it occurs, yep. is at the moment irreversible. Yep. The lesions that people talk about on the MRI scans are effectively scars. So there's multiple sclerotic lesions in the brain, hence the name multiple sclerosis. You don't want those to develop if you can avoid those. But one of the things that does happen is that when you first see someone, they may already have 50, 60, 70 lesions on their brain, but they've had their first symptomatic event. So there might already be a reasonable burden of disease. And, but then that's the problem with MS, is that everyone is an individual. And we've heard from sisters who have vastly different types of MS that, or, or progress. So everyone does things differently, and it's very hard to generalise. I arrived there to see Colleen on a stretcher and she had to be defibrillated, that's how bad I was. What drove you to go to Russia to have this treatment? I was getting worse all the time and I didn't want to be looking back and saying, well, gee, what if? What if I did try that? What if it did help? You were sentenced to life in prison for the murder of your fiancé. Wow, Apple. Best picture. So amazing, right? Yeah. It's amazing. Jennifer Lawrence. Selena Gomez documentary. Why don't I have a documentary? DiCaprio, Scorsese, De Niro. Hey, Apple. Call me. So we're talking about you now? That's why I showed up. Deserve a teacher who believes in us? That does sound nice. Hank's a novelist, so it's his job to be kind of a dick. I think you're pretty funny, huh? A little funny. <laughs> you know, I think so. It's an unfair world. I'm not going to even things up with a few kind acts. The brand new series, Lucky Hank, premieres March 20, only on Stan. Welcome the new era of supercars at the thrifty Newcastle 500. March 10 to 12. Book now at Ticket Tech. Supercars. Unforgettable. Still struggling to believe it. You were sentenced to death in the United States. He said, we found your son, he was murdered and you're under arrest. How long was it before you saw your home again? 20 years. Colleen, you've lived with MS for more than 20 years and you've tried at least six different medications. Now, five years ago, your disease escalated to secondary progressive. How was that affecting you and what did you decide to do? Well, <laughs> how it affected me was, well, I guess the first thing I noticed was that I just couldn't walk as, for as long as I used to. I had no problem before. And eventually I, I had trouble just standing. I had tried half a dozen different drugs that I pretty much reacted to everyone or they just didn't make me feel any better, shall we say. There was no change and I stuck with them all for a few months. Sabri was the last one and I started on that and I was walking when I started it only for about 10 minutes or something but by 11 months later I was using a walker so that didn't help me and they've been talking about this treatment HSCT that was being offered overseas and I guess that sort of piqued my interest they were saying people were getting up out of wheelchairs and walking you know so that's pretty crazy I did all the research and I thought this sounds like something fair dinkum and, and I tried to get into the trial. Here? Yes, and because I didn't have active lesions, because I'm secondary progressive I guess, <coughs> um, that was a, a no, that was the one criteria I didn't meet. So that was it, because the criteria of course is very strict, they have to be you know, doing the right thing. So then I thought 
I'm going to look at these other, because you could have it in other countries, and so lots of research trying to find the one that I thought was the safest experience in providing the treatment. And where was that? For me, it was Russia. They had... And how much did the treatment cost? In Australian dollars, it was around about 74000 I think, at the time. What drove you to go to Russia to have this treatment? There was nothing here that I could see. So, and I wanted to try everything that I could. I didn't want to be looking back and saying, well, gee, what if? What if I did try that? What if it did help? Mm. Kel, um, your Colleen's husband. happened during that treatment? Well, she got four weeks into the procedure and uh, she was looking pretty good. She was bouncing along, sending me videos. Very. And then I think it was day nine or ten of isolation, I got a phone call where I was staying and they said, Kel, you need to come down to the hospital. And they didn't tell me why, but I arrived there lying on a stretcher and she was being taken to the ICU there. Um, she developed pneumonia. And she ended up in the ICU for 18 days. Anyway, we overstayed our visa and if you overstay your visa in Russia, you're basically a criminal. So you have to hide from the law. Um, so I was a refugee and a criminal fugitive. They said to me, look, you can return back to Australia. And I said, look, I can't do that. You know, my wife's on a, on a deathbed. I mean, she had to be defibrillated. That's how bad it was. But I must say, you know, the doctors over there are incredible because they saved a life. I mean, they were just brilliant. So. And how having, did you avoid stayed, going to jail? I hid in the hospital for nearly two months. <laughs> so I saw a sanctuary there and they were good enough to put me up and feed me and all that type of thing. So I knew at that time that we were in a little bit of trouble, but I dare not tell Colleen. She was, you know, she was on life support, so I couldn't say, hey, look, you know, we're breaking the law, we're in deep trouble. So at the end of that two-month period, Colleen had, had improved, she was getting better. So then it was decided that I must <laughs> throw my hands up to the courts and everything else and have, me into, have myself into the, uh, the judicial system in Russia, which I did do. We were given 10 days to leave. We were each fined 5,000 rubles, which doesn't amount to a lot. You know, it's only $250 each. But I'm pretty sure we're, um, we're barred from, uh, from Russia for the next five years. <laughs> for the next five years. Could be and meanwhile, ten, could you be were ten. getting better. I, in the meantime, Colleen was improving. That was two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. How are you now? I'm improved. I had an EDSS, which is your disability score, between 1 and 10. And I was a 6.5 and using a walker. At the time I went to Russia and I'm now apparently a 3.5, my neurologist tells me. What have you noticed, Kel, in terms of change? You see her on the left there before we went to Russia and on the right afterwards. She, her mobility's improved but also she's, she's more aware of things now. Mm. Her alertness is there and the so-called fog has lifted as far as I can see. You know, she's much improved. Bruce, what is this HSCT treatment that Colleen had? It's a hemopoietic stem cell transplant. You give people a, a small dosage of chemotherapy which suppresses their bone marrow and then as that bone marrow regrows it produces a lot of stem cells which you harvest. You take them away and purify them then you put the new the stem cells back in and you hope that when the stem cells regenerate the bone marrow they regenerate the immune system in a slightly different way which doesn't recognise the brain as being foreign. Aaron, you also had this treatment in Russia for your MS. Did it work for you? Um, unfortunately, not. Um, sort of slowed it down a little bit, but mm. it's kept continuing. You're 46. You have primary progressive MS, which is the most severe form and the least common form of MS. How has it affected you? In every way. Everything I do. Um, I can't stand up anymore. I have to shower on a seat. I was a motorcycle mechanic. I had my own business. I used to ride road bikes and um, dirt bikes were my passion. My son, I couldn't enjoy that with my son. That's probably the hardest thing. How long have you had it for? We sort of trace it back to around 18. Um, were my first symptoms, dropping a beer in the pub. I haven't taken a sip yet, and I think I'm still holding it. 
and people are like, like, like saying, are you drunk? And I'm like, I haven't drunk a bit yet. Samantha, you're Aaron's wife and carer, um, and you've been together since you were teenagers. With hindsight, you know, can you see things now? Absolutely. Right back to, as Aaron said, 18, we can see um, he would drop a glass, he would fall, or he'd have a motorcycle accident and just take that little bit longer to heal. Um, there was a lot of that. Yeah, lots of accidents, so we just blamed it on that. How did it take to get diagnosed with MS? So in 2012, Aaron had an episode where he started getting a lot of numbness and tingling. It was getting a lot worse and he was dragging his left foot and he was walking into walls and I thought, this is something serious. So we went and saw her and the doctor diagnosed that he had a blown disc in his spine. Uh, so we thought, OK, we'll get the blown disc operated on. The specialist told us he'd be up and back and walking in six weeks and Aaron just didn't get back up. He has pretty much been in a wheelchair since then and that was in at the end of 2012, about two weeks before his 40th birthday. And what's it like for you as his partner watching him go through this? Uh, as he said, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's, it changed our lives. It was like a rug being pulled out from underneath us. Russia was a huge thing. We raised the funds ourselves and got ourselves to Russia and then we had the, the recovery, which we thought we were going to do OK. We just thought it was the normal recovery. And things just have been getting worse and worse ever since. MS Research Australia says as of 2016, it knows of more than 100 Australians who've had this treatment, this HSCT treatment overseas. Todd, is it available in Australia? It is available. And look, I think it is a very promising treatment for highly selected uh, patients. These are patients who have relapsing remitting MS. Uh, usually they're fairly early in their disease course uh, before they've acquired disability, but who have very active MS and they're failing conventional therapies. And certainly the evidence that we do have available from trials that have been conducted uh, in Australia and around the world is that it can be helpful and beneficial for that, those sub, that subgroup of patients, those highly selected patients. I'm very uh, happy that Colleen had a positive experience, but again, it is the exception rather than the rule that people with progressive MS do well with this type of treatment. So to meet the requirements to yeah. have it in Australia, you have to have relapsing remitting MS? That's right. That's right. Not the other two types? Because you're the most likely to benefit from it um, and because there is significant harm that can be associated with it. Can you understand people going overseas and trying it if, if everything else hasn't worked? Uh, yeah, I have complete empathy for people uh, you know, doing things like that because uh, you know, it is difficult. Lydia, there's no treatment for your secondary progressive MS. Have you considered something like this treatment overseas? Never, never. Not at all. I'd be, I would not be going doing that at all. Why? Because I just think it's too risky. I don't want to any risk. I just want to be alive. Todd, what hope is there for people like Lydia and Aaron who have progressive types of MS? What, you know, what hope is it? Uh, as we speak at the moment, there are no uh, currently available therapies for progressive forms of MS. Uh, however, there have been some trials done uh, in the last few, two or three years, which have, uh, have been the first trials um, to show positive results in patients. And uh, at the moment, the medications uh, that are involved in those trials uh, before the PBS in Australia, and we're hopeful that they will become available for patients with progressive forms of MS. But even those agents are probably going to be most beneficial to people who already have uh, a degree of mobility. And it's about slowing their disability progression. They're not wonder drugs. People who already have quite severely, you know, quite established disability still may, are unlikely to benefit or may, may not even qualify to have the drugs. Mm. So that magic word, the cure, mm. how far away are we from that? If you're talking about putting people into long-term remission from their MS, uh, then we already have, um, we can actually do that for a lot of people already with the therapies that we have. If, however, you're talking about putting them into a state where we can tell them with confidence that their disease is never going to come back, then we're not quite there and there's still a lot of work to be done. Mm. Lydia, what are you hoping for, given your condition? 
I don't want any change. I'm happy to pray to the day the same. Um, I'm happy kind of living in a nursing home, keeping myself occupied. It's not too bad, so that's all I'm hoping for. Mm. Aaron, what are you hoping for? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. It could be something else and I'll try it. Mm. Caroline, what are you hoping for with your MS? I just really hope that it doesn't progress any further. I'm just praying that I will never have another relapse and that it won't progress. So I'll do everything in my power to make sure that that doesn't happen. Lavinia, what are you hoping for? Hoping for a cure one day. Um, I really wouldn't like it to progress and hopefully be able to finish my tertiary education in the future. Yeah. And what about you, Zoe? The start of it was pretty aggressive, so I'm glad the treatment I'm on is working. consider myself quite lucky, but I would love to see a cure and I guess just an advance in technology and that gap between relapsing, remitting and the progressive forms of MS caught up. What about having kids? Do you think about that? Me and my husband um, definitely had that idea that, you know, we would go down that road. But I guess the risk for me of um, falling pregnant and then having a baby, if I can't look after myself 100%, how on earth would I be able to care for a baby? And the risk of me having a relapse and potentially developing another lesion and not being able to walk, that would just absolutely destroy me. Mm. So you've decided not to? Yep. Mm. Sophie, you have a three-year-old son. Did you consider yeah, the risks um, and particularly given your family history as well? When we were trying to get pregnant, I had to change MS drugs because it needed to be safe for my son. And also I knew that if I was pregnant, I would then stop taking drugs and that was a really terrifying thought. I'd, um, I've been on MS drugs since I was 21, so 15 years at that time. So to actually stop for nine months was really, really scary. And um, what happened? I was fine. I was so well. But I also remember the fear, my neurology, me, that once after you give birth, you, your chances of having a relapse are very, very high. And he gave me an example of a lady that um, the next day she couldn't walk and she was in a wheelchair. And so I was so excited about having a baby. But God, that's a great thing to be told, <laughs> isn't it? But yeah, I was so terrified that I'd go blind or I'd be in a wheelchair and I'd have this newborn. So I had to make a decision once I gave birth whether to go back on drugs immediately or to breastfeed and not go on drugs. So I chose to go on the drugs. Now I remember giving birth I think, like I say, on the Tuesday, on the Wednesday, I was on a drip and having the drugs again. And then I couldn't breastfeed. And that was really hard because I had so much judgment, which I didn't really expect. And even when then I had to explain, oh, I've got MS and I'm on drugs, so I can't breastfeed. Oh, but, you know, it's not breast is best. And it was just oh, really awful. <laughs> so yeah, that I found that really awful. hard. Yeah, just people judging me for that. But... I'm really glad I did it and I didn't perhaps... And would you have another child? No. Um, I feel really lucky. It was hard to get pregnant, so I feel really lucky that I've got him. Mm. And Monica, what about you? I've never wanted children, but if I did, I wouldn't. I think it would be really selfish of me. I, my partner cares for me. I can't live a normal life, a child, but I feel it would deserve. Mm. So... What about you and what does the future hold for you? I haven't really thought about having kids. At the moment I'm um, competing in my sport and I'm back at uni trying to study. So that's been difficult, but trying to get through it. What are you studying? A Bachelor of Animal and Vet Bioscience. Sometimes I'm not so well and other times I feel great. So I just kind of have to take each day as it comes and see what happens. And the horses? The horses are good and very busy. I train every day almost. And so you ride every day? Yes. We're campaigning for the Tokyo Paralympics at the moment. And I was just named on the long list for the games today. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so when will you find out? 
So we have a few more qualifying events to attend and then I think in June the Paralympic Committee will release the team. So Well, good luck. Thank you. Yeah, we'll all be watching and we'll keep tabs on that. And thank you so much for joining us tonight, everybody, for sharing your story. That is all we have time for here, but let's keep talking online and you can also watch loads of episodes, past episodes of Insight on SBS On Demand. Thanks for watching. Thank you, everyone.